This is a next-gen web track. The talk is called Reverse Engineering Browser Components, Dissecting a Hack in Silverlight, HTML5, and Flex. Please give a warm welcome to Sriras Shah. Uh, thank you. OK, uh, so before I start, uh, just a brief introduction. Uh, I'm a founder and director of a company called Blue Infi Solutions, and we primarily focus on application security. Uh, in past work with NetSquare, Foundstone, Chase, and IBM. Uh, my primary interest is uh, doing research on application security and last couple of years focusing on more on Web 2.0, uh, Silverlight, Flash, uh, SOA, etc. Uh, a lot of papers and tools written by me. Uh, you can find it on the site. Uh, and these are some of the books written by me. Uh, Web 2.0 security, hacking web services, and web hacking. Uh, okay, so let's get going. Uh, so the plan for uh, next one hour would be, uh, we'll start with uh, some basic bird eye view of application security landscape. Uh, then we'll focus on uh, techniques for reverse engineering browser components. Uh, so we'll try to address source object and runtime analysis. Uh, we'll focus on analyzing AJAX driven HTML5 and DOM based applications. Uh, we'll touch upon Silverlight and a Flash-based application, something on a mobile devices as such. Uh, try to see some uh, application defense. Uh, we'll cover some of the demos as we go. Uh, I'm planning to have some of the new tools getting up, uh, XAP scan, app code trace, scan droid, and HTML5 scanning. Uh, try to discuss some tricks uh, for scanning, flash checking, eval, uh, the eval, etc. So that's the plan for uh, the talk. Uh, bird eye view, essentially we do uh, around 10 to 15 applications per week uh, where we do manual testing and scanning uh, as such. Uh, and lately what we are seeing is uh, when you are doing just scanning, some of the things which are getting missed is uh, DOM-based access, hidden business logic, uh, information leakage. Uh, a lot of components which are running on RIA using flash and a silver light uh, is difficult to uh, assess and audit. Uh, we miss a BSQL, that's a blind SQL, uh, over various different streams, be it a JSON or XML and so on. So these are a, a big chunk of uh, vulnerability which are getting missed uh, while you are doing automated scanning, uh, not paying a lot of attention with the, with the human skills as such. And if you try to analyze uh, why we are missing this uh, and try to identify what is a problem domain, uh, one is scanners are failing in discovery. Uh, so say it's possible that you have uh, your uh, uh, SOA residing in your flash, or say you have a business logic which is running on the, on the silver light and so on. Uh, architectures are complex. We have various different uh, set of JavaScripts coming in uh, and so on, a lot of libraries out there. Uh, so it's making things difficult. Uh, at the same time, nowadays, you have a lot of code which is coming on a client side, so we need uh, some kind of a white box analysis needs to be done on the client side components uh, and difficult to discover as such. Uh, so while doing manual assessment and audit, we come up with uh, various different uh, approaches, and one of them is essentially doing a black box testing where you uh, add some components of white box analysis like a source and object level analysis on the client side. Uh, and deep protocol inspection uh, for uh, over what kind of a traffic which is going on HTTP as such. So this helps in identifying uh, the vulnerabilities uh, which we usually uh, miss by automated scanner as such. Uh, so one of the major technology shift uh, which you can see, uh, in the past when we are looking at web 1.0 application, we had a uh, complete layers where we say, okay, this is my data access layer runs on server, this is my business logic layer runs on server, and this is my presentation layer which runs using HTML and JavaScript which runs in my browser. Now that particular layer is essentially what have happened with the introduction of these new set of technologies. It's pretty much not just residing on a server. There are certain components which are actually coming out and running on the browser. Uh, so what we have is uh, this little gray area, which you are, a green area which you are looking at, is a part of a presentation layer, business logic layer, as well as some kind of a data access layer, is not running on your server, but it is running from your browser. And that component 
has introduction of various new set of technologies like HTML5, storage, WebSocket, WebSQL, and XHR. All these are actually running from your browser. If you look at Silverlight, that's the Microsoft platform, WCF, .NET, Silverlight. Again, this is running from your browser. Uh, and on a Flash or Adobe, uh, you have a Flash, AMF, Flag, Storage, XAML, and so on. And then everything get glued uh, by your document object model and JS. And on top of it, you have uh, a stack uh, which runs on a mobile devices, be it Android, iPhone, uh, iPad, and so on. And these mobile applications uh, call the browser component inside their application and maybe, maybe making a HTML5 call or using the storage or a file system and so on. So this is the one of the major shift which we are looking at. Uh, so we take a Flash application, decompile, and try to see whether do we have any browser server-side components which are running on a server, say maybe, maybe a data access call or maybe a business logic and so on. So this is one of the area where a uh, lot of lot of different uh, lot of different technology evolution has happened in last one and a half or two or three years, which we are seeing uh, in real life application uh, in current contacts. Uh, so, what are the new features inside browser? Uh, support for various other technologies and plugins, Silverlight and Flash, QuickTime, etc. Uh, we have a new set of tags which are coming in, uh, which is media forms, iframe, etc. Again, HTML5 has opened up a, a new stack of the tags here. Uh, we have XML HTTP request object, which is uh, level two. Uh, so we had a level one, now we, have, we are on a level two, uh, which allows uh, some kind of a, a shared resource access uh, over cross domain. Uh, we have a WebSocket, uh, so again a TCP streaming over a WebSocket available directly from the browser. Uh, Interestingly, now we have a lots of different storage capabilities in the browser. We can store session, local, or global. So we have a local storage APIs inside the browser as a part of HTML5, which runs. Uh, we have a WebSQL database, which again runs on the, on the browser. So you can have your own little database, which runs inside a browser. So when you load the page, you can say, okay, dump this data or data contact uh, contacts into my browser, and the browser will actually will not come and make a, make a query on the back end. It will just make a query on the local browser itself. We have a very powerful document object model, which is DOM level three specs. Uh, sandboxing and iframe isolations, logics, uh, logic are in place in various different browsers, be it a Chrome or a Firefox and so on. And uh, browsers are, or libraries are supporting uh, all sorts of streams now, like JSON, AMF, WCF, XML, and so on. And all these are also uh, can be accessed over a mobile. So this is how the whole uh, landscape of, say, uh, browsers are evolving. Uh, so what is a browser model? If you look at, definitely there is a core policies on the, on the bottom, uh, which talks about same origin policy and sandboxing. Uh, then on the top, we have a network access layer where we have uh, essentially three to four ways of talking to the server or a cross-domain calls uh, as well. Uh, XHR, WebSocket, uh, plugin sockets, we have a browser native network services and so on. And then the top two levels are interested for us is the one is a process logic where you have definitely a JavaScript running, then you have the whole uh, DOM and event model which allows you to access WebSQL and a storage which is residing in your browser. And then you have a parsers and threads. So now you have uh, in your browser you have something called web workers. So you can start a process inside your web page uh, itself. So you can have a web workers running for you inside your uh, HTML page. And topping up the presentation layer, there are three important stacks. One is HTML5, a Silverlight, and a Flash. And a HTML5 is native to the browser, while Silverlight and a Flash needs a plugin beneath to run it. Uh, and it, pretty much all these technologies are supported across browsers, HTML5, some, some, some uh, browsers support some set of technologies, others are not supporting it. Uh, I think Chrome 5 is, is supporting HTML5 fully, and then uh, IE and uh, Firefox supporting in their limited capabilities. Uh, so these are the layers, presentation, process logic, network access, and a core policies, uh, where SOP, sandbox, and a shared pol resources, these are the three important policies. Uh, so application architecture, if you look at 
uh, for 2.0 or you know, next generation applications are changing. Uh, so what we have over here is a, a browser which is running AJAX, Flash, HTML, JS will make a call to your web server, web server will make call to your application server. And then what you have is uh, thin layers like web services, data access and authentication which will uh, fetch the information locally from the server. And then the whole web services will go out and uh, try to communicate with various different uh, boxes out there, maybe your banking application, trading application, weather, email, blog, etc., and then tunnel all the data from third party back to your browser. Uh, so this tunnel is essentially uh, maybe supplying data in a JSON or XML or AMF or so on. So whatever way new data is coming, you are tunneling it back to your, your browser, and that browser can be running on your mobile device or browser can be running on your laptop and so on. So this is kind of a application architecture we are looking at in, in current context where your information source is not just local to the, to the box or local to your application. The source is actually the whole internet. You are maybe fetching information from anywhere and tunneling that information back to the, to the browser. So one of the weakest link in this architecture is this trust of the information because now you are fetching information which is completely untrusted sources. So you have a malicious JavaScript coming or you have some untrusted data coming in uh, going back to your browser. Uh, this essentially expands the attack surface. So on a server side, we have a query string, post name, XML, JSON, HTTP variable, file attachment, feeds, open APIs, etc. would be uh, your web server side components. And then on the browser side, you have entry points like JSON, HTTP response, DOM calls, events, API streams, and so on. Uh, so this is how uh, this whole new architecture would expand attack surface, will give you uh, more entry points to both the server and the browser end. Uh, if you look at the AppSec dynamics, which keep on changing over years, if four to seven and seven to 10, if you look at the OS top 10, uh, there are a few changes here and there. For example, in last, uh, we had a unvalidated redirects and forward added. Now we have a security misconfiguration added over here. Uh, but still, A1 and A2 would be injection uh, and uh, cross-site scripting. And then there are a bunch of uh, other attack vectors. Now, if we try to map it to, the, to this new generation or a new stack of browser technologies which we have and try to map it, so... Uh, on the injection, we have a JSON, EMF, and so on on the server side, and WebSQL injection on the client side. Uh, A2, that's uh, cross-site scripting, DOM-based, script injections, direct third-party streams, HTML tags. There are a bunch of new HTML5 tags out there, uh, which can cause cross-site scripting. A broken authentication is interesting, where uh, partial logic would be residing on your browser, so pretty much uh, one can uh, bypass that, uh, be it a local storage or be it a JS, Flash, or Silverlight. So there are, uh, there are persistent cookies which are kicking in in your HTML5 and a local storage. Uh, insecure direct object referencing, again, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, pointing to a database layer, maybe uh, directly accessing through a browser. Uh, CSRF with XML, JSON, AMF string, XHR, uh, server security misconfiguration, uh, trust model, as I discussed. Uh, hidden URL and so on, A8, uh, where you have uh, unvalidated redirects, where again you have a DOM-based uh, redirect and spoofing is possible. So this is how, and then you have a whole stake or stack of a mobile 10, which again you can link it to uh, some of these browser components. Okay, so this is basic. Now we'll move into uh, reverse engineering. So if you look at the quick, look at the quick, uh, uh, at the stack, uh, the kind of a stack which we are looking in the browser, HTML5, Silverlight, Flash, and Flax over SWF. And then browser will be making all sorts of different calls. These calls would be asynchronous call or a synchronous call uh, going to the server. Uh, the streams would be XML, JSON, and so on. And your Flash or a Flax may be making a backend call over SOAP or AMF and so on. So let me quickly show this little demo here. Uh, so here is, a, is an application where you have all different flavors of uh, protocols and stuff like XML, Flash, JSON, Silverlight, AMF, HTML5 over here. Uh, and if you look, open up the, open up the, the Chrome, 
uh, toolbox. They have a development toolbox uh, tools out there, which will show you uh, some of these HTML5 stuff over here. It will say if it has a database, it has a local storage, if it has a say, session storage, or so on. And then network will show you all the protocol as such. So quickly analyzing uh, the protocols and in their mechanism, you can use this uh, plugin. So it will show you the calls which are going back and forth over here. Uh, so this first call, say for example, ASPX, which is making a call to the back end, and it is uh, going over, see if I click any of these links over here, and it will actually make a call at the back end, and this essentially XML call, which is going at the back end. Or for example, if we take over here, we'll go to the JSON call and try to see. Okay, so now this particular call which is of the JSON string. So it'll make a backend call to JSON service ASHX. It's a JSON call. Uh, now we click on the EMF traffic. So we have the plugin which gets called and the whole application get loaded in a flash. So it'll make a call at the backend to gate, gateway ASPX, which is essentially a binary protocol which is going here, uh, which is EMF traffic. So AMF traffic going from a flax-driven uh, or a flash-driven application over here. Uh, it'll take a cross. Now this is a Silverlight. So now we are loading a Silverlight application. We'll look for a client access policy and so on, and the making a backend call to DVDs for less, less .asmx, which is a, a SOA-based resource as such. Now we are loading the HTML5 application over here. So if you look at the HTML5 application and try to see resource, you can see a category where a database has been created on the on the browser. So if you click over here and you can see the database over here. This is a, essentially a local database, which is a web SQL over here, and so on. Uh, so this is how uh, the current application would be running in a browser. It has a multiple protocols. It has a multiple stack to address, be it a Silverlight, a Flash, Flax, and so on. Okay, so reverse engineering approach. Uh, uh, there are essentially, there are a few different approaches which you can take while doing a reverse engineering. One is a static code analysis, object code observation, uh, runtime instrumentation, and scope reduction and protocol analysis as such. And objective is to find and track uh, vulnerabilities or any weaknesses which we have on the application. Uh, so we are defining our scope here. We are not looking at the browser components which are written by the vendors. We are focusing on the application level components which are designed, developed, and integrated by developers. And these components would be mainly sitting in this two area, presentation and process logic area, uh, and making a call to web SQL and a storage. And uh, these components may be returned by HTML in HTML5 or Silverlight or Adobe and so on. So that's our uh, scope of analysis. Uh, goals is essentially what we are looking at is uh, doing the assessment and uh, putting up countermeasures during your secure SDLC. Uh, so discovering hidden resource, call identification and manipulations, understanding inner calls, uh, browser events and script mapping, uh, variable or call traversal, and so on. So these are the essential goals uh, to discover uh, vulnerabilities over here. Uh, so starting with the NA, uh, AJAX, DOM, and HTML5 based uh, applications. Uh, so we can, ha we can have a three approaches over here while doing a reverse engineering. One is uh, doing a static code analysis, or you can do a runtime analysis, or you can do a debugging and discovery. Uh, so first is essentially what we are doing is a static code analysis where we uh, load the page in the browser and then try to perform a static code analysis over a JavaScript. So say for example, over here, we have, a, we have a tool called DOM scan. So DOM scan will actually load the, you, you open a DOM scan and say, okay, this is the URL which I want to uh, analyze. Uh, so it will go and load all the calls over here. So what have happened is uh, it will start the IE, instance of IE, it will start. Okay, just hold on. So it will start an instance of a IE load the page, load all the JavaScript, and everything would be available on the DOM scan console over here. So now I have all, all the components which are running in my browser are loaded on DOM scan, and I say, okay, uh, show me all my eval, hidden, and document.write call. 
So I can perform some kind of a static code analysis over here. So it'll start scanning application, it'll start scanning the pages over here, and we'll show where the calls are. So we found these many eval calls over here. And then we, we have this particular eval call, and now we are interested in uh, doing the tainted flow analysis. So we try to say, okay, traverse across the variable where this particular variable is going, uh, coming from and going through. So we'll try to analyze a source and a sync for it. So it's okay going into this particular function and then it's going to this function and so on. So it's traverse across application and show the, the path of its traversal over here. And then finally it hits to your location. So it's going to your search location bar. So now we know that the variable is actually coming from here and hitting to your eval call. So this particular routine now you can have a clear case of cross-site scripting. So I can actually inject anything over here uh, this particular variable, which is PID equal to two, and this is again a DOM-based cross-site scripting, which is directly going and injected into our eval routine. So now over here, if I say instead of a two, I I close the loop and say comment the rest of the script here, and then pretty much this is a raw JavaScript or a raw script handle which we have, so we can start injecting anything over here. We say, okay, alert or whatever we want to do over here. Document.cookie and so on. So the, this is the way how uh, the first approach is doing a static code analysis by which we can actually uh, find the, or discover a vulnerability. Uh, the second one is, is even more interesting where we do a runtime analysis because say for example, uh, you load an application and click a button. When you click a button, when you load an application, you may get a 50,000 lines of JavaScript coming in, uh, loaded in your browser. But when you click a button, out of this 50,000 script, only 50 lines of JavaScript is going to get executed, which is, uh, which is mapped to uh, that particular event or a function. So what we have created is, uh, is a little plugin uh, for Firefox, which is called a DOM Tracer. So you can start a DOM Tracer, and what we have added is uh, some of the the rules as well. So you can say, okay, what you're looking for while the, the call is going through. So you can define those parameters in your rules file. So okay, you say, I want to analyze this particular application and what I want to do is uh, show me when a browser makes eval call or document dot write calls or some inner HTML. You can, you can put all the calls which you're interested in tracking. So you have all these different calls defined in your, in, uh, in your uh, rules file, there's a simple regular expression which you are putting in, and then just passing the file over here, and now you're starting your tracer. So now, this particular window, whenever you fire an event, whatever functions are getting called or whatever lines of JavaScript being executed will show you, and then you can take your analysis from that point onwards. So we click this particular link here. Uh, so, bunch of JavaScript which is executed, and you can see over here, uh, the profile of the of the call. So it will show, okay, I executed this function first, which is line number 92 over here. Uh, so this function was executed, and you can see little three arrows over here, which shows uh, whatever you have mapped to your rules file. Let's say, okay, this particular guy is using an eval call here. Uh, and these are your document.get element calls and so on. So this is where we are doing a scope reduction. We say, okay, after 100,000 of lines of code, now we have our scope re uh, reduction uh, to 100 lines or 150 lines only. So this is a kind of a doing a runtime analysis. Uh, and a third approach which you can take is a debugging. Uh, there are uh, good debuggers out there uh, for a JavaScript, and my favorite one is a Firebug. Firebug has a debugger bundled in. Uh, so say for example over here, this particular application where you, it's a completely 2.0 application uh, where a business logic is residing over here. So you click a bank information over here. So say for example, I logged in into the application and this particular application showing you, okay, these are my banking information, which say, okay, my bank account which, with access and this is my number over here. And when I make this particular call, you can see over here, uh, encoded value which is going in. So they have, the, the whole application is written in JavaScript and it has some business logic embedded in the JavaScript uh, which is 
allowing these kind of uh, encryption, this kind of a calls, which are uh, get uh, made at the back end using AJAX or so on. Okay, so now over here, we go ahead and uh, open a Firebug console. So this is essentially a Firebug console which you are looking at over here. And we'll show you all the JavaScript over here. And you can say, okay, show me get bank function because if that's the function which I was interested in. So it is showing me a get bank function and you can see over here some keys are created and some encryption is going on and so on. So there is a bunch of things uh, which may be going in uh, while you make this, this particular call. So I'm interested in tracking this call. So I set up a debug point over here and say click the function again. So now I, uh, my execution has been stopped here and now I can play around with the variables inside the browser memory and try to see uh, what, what, can I, what, what can I extract uh, from the functions. So over here, for example, the key is this and the plane is Shirat. So I change it to say some other user, say Nisha is another user and I say, okay, play. Now you can see the whole banking information has been changed. Now it is, I'm not looking at my banking information but the other user's banking information since uh, the business logic, a partial business logic has been transferred from server to the, to the browser. So again, this is a third different way how you can go ahead and try to analyze a JavaScript. So you can use a static code analysis, you can do a runtime, scope reduction, and third is a debugging. Yeah. Which analysis? Okay, taint analysis on the code. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, so what he's saying is like there is a possibility if you have uh, the whole tainted analysis, the first one, SCA analysis, where you can completely automate uh, if you have a tool like Dominator, which will allow you to do uh, the complete. Uh, analysis in automated fashion. So you may not have to do a scope reduction uh, as well. Yeah, true, that's possible. Uh, you can have a, if you have a full-fledged uh, static code analysis which, uh, which runs uh, and parses the JavaScript, then pretty much you can do that uh, on the fly. Uh, the second application is like looking at the Flash and the Flax apps. Uh, so what you have is a Flash is a very simple framework which is uh, nowadays running on a Flax framework. Uh, so there are a set of new technology, set of technologies involved in a Flax. One is like MXM MXML, uh, Action Script, and a JavaScript. So it allows you to write your application in, in those languages. Uh, so it's pretty simple. You can create your XML document, which is your presentation uh, layer, which gets converted into a SWF or a Flash file. And whatever you want to have a dynamic code will get converted into uh, action script. So you can write those stuff in an action script and then just use uh, compilers like MX, MLC compiler or so on. And you can, you, can, you can pick a switch if you want to create a, a web-based application or you want to create an offline Adobe Air application. So based on that, uh, you do a coding once, but you get a two flavors of application at the same time. Uh, so you get a desktop application or you get a uh, uh, web-based application. Again, uh, the application which gets created is, uh, is a format is called SWF. So it will get the SWF format application over here. Uh, so your application will be in SWF format. Uh, you can decompile these SWF format files and try to analyze uh, what, is, uh, what is residing. Uh, SWF file starts with the backend on AMF protocol. So it runs on action message formatting protocol. And then you can have various different sorts of vulnerabilities in your uh, flash files as well, be it cross-site scripting or server-side injections and so on. So say for example over here, you have a simple file, a uh, simple SWF file over here. So first, one thing which you can always do is download the SWF file and decompile the file. Uh, so you can do a view source and you can, we can identify SWF files over here. 
And there are tools out there, where various different decompilers out there. One of them is called SWF dump. So you can use SWF dump, say this is an inventory SWF file which I want to dump. So I get the, the actual uh, bytecode of the SWF file and then I start discovering the components inside SWF file. I say, okay, show me the backend web services. So it'll say me, show me the backend services or a gateway calls and so on. So I can identify these calls over here or a product method at the back end and so on. So a lot of different things which you can uh, harvest from uh, this uh, calls. You can find public properties, you can find uh, publicly called function and so on. So all these pretty much you can identify and then you can reverse match with the actual uh, HTTP traffic over here. So one thing you can do that and then definitely if you find the AMF streams, uh, which you can find from Flash making a call to AMF. These AMF streams can be injected as such. Uh, so this where we are passing admin admin, for example, in a function here. And we can use a, use a proxy which do a AMF decoding and coding. So say for example, burp is doing it or a Charles proxy and so on. So you can identify as if this is an example of a Charles proxy. So over here you have uh, this particular AMF traffic, which is going to the server. Uh, we copy it, make another instance of the call, and now we go ahead and into AMF and say, okay, uh, change admin to single quote, for example, and try to execute over here. And you can see the whole stack, which is coming back. So there is an SQL, possible SQL injection over here. So next you can actually go ahead and uh, edit it and try to pass on the play, payload, say one or one equal to one and so on. So this is again, uh, I would say a deep packet injection or deep uh, analysis of a, of a protocol which needs, uh, and same with the WCF protocol, which is a Windows uh, protocol uh, as such. Uh, similarly, you can, from the call, uh, you can grab certain patterns and based on that, you can uh, find some of the vulnerabilities. For example, over here, uh, we say, okay, this is another file, SWF file, and it is using, say, for example, get URL call. So this can be vulnerable to a scripting, uh, or this particular application is actually uh, taking variable and rendering into HTML uh, inside your flash file. Uh, as you can see over here, HTML rendering is happening. So it's possible to have a cross-site scripting over here. So if you look at the actual application over here, of SWF file. Okay. Uh, so this is your test3.swf file and this is your another SWF file which we are looking at. So now if we, instead of uh, this, we submit it and the parameters are actually going from over here. So instead of that, since it is doing HTML rendering, we can pass on ahref over here and it will actually cause a cross-site scripting. And similarly, if it is taking a get URL call inside your uh, flash file, then also it's possible to cross, cause a cross-site scripting. So this is essentially how uh, you can do a decompilation of SWF file and try to identify uh, various different uh, issues associated with your uh, application as such. Uh, so this is where we are passing the click tag here. And instead of the URL, we are passing a JavaScript alert, uh, which is going to get executed on the browser. Okay, uh, so this is how uh, Flash files or a Flax application can be uh, can be analyzed and decompiled. Another interesting uh, application issue which we are seeing is something called flash jacking. Uh, so what we have over here is uh, a combination of a DOM-based cross-site scripting, CSRF, and a flash. Uh, so say for example, you have your banking application where a flash plugin or a flash application is a, is a your login. Uh, so you have a login.swf file, for example. And on the same page, you have a DOM-based uh, cross-site scripting, for example. Uh, so it's possible, actually, to 
uh, make these kind of a call where say document.get element and fetch the actual location of SWF file and then point it to some malicious SWF file which, which gets loaded instead of your actual SWF file over here. So this is ex exactly like we used to do a click checking. This is kind of a flash checking where we, uh, we hijack the actual flash application to something else uh, in your browser. So say for example, Over here, you say, for example, this is your actual bank. So this is a banking application. And if you look at, it's running on 100.111. It can be completely a different domain as such. And you have this uh, login.swf file over here. And somewhere over here, you have an eval login. So it is actually a DOM-based eval call, uh, which is going inside the browser. Uh, so now, say, for example, we go to the something different, uh, it's an alert one, so it's actually just running the cross-site scripting. So that's, uh, that's a, it's a vulnerability over here. Now, instead of alert, we try to do alert high, for example, over here. And as you can see over here, since a uh, browser is going to do URL encoding, it's going to pass on percentage 20 to percentage 20. So, and this is going to get, not going to get executed because uh, eval call will not entertain uh, percentage 22 as such. So that's another problem which we need to, uh, need, to uh, need to bypass if you want to exploit this particular scenario as such. Now you have the another page over here, uh, which is in completely separate domain. It's uh, running on a 200, uh, 100 200 can be another domain as such. And as you can see, the, the the pages is the same, there is just the one line. The SWF file is the same, just for the verification, I've just kept a, a little red line over here. So this has been kept here. Now I go back to the, to the target domain over here. And I say, I just want to inject something over here. So this is my kind of a payload, document.get element by name login item equal to zero and SRC. So get the source of that login.swf file and replace it to my malicious SWF file, which is running on 200.8080. So I can actually grab this information over here. Okay. So I take this guy and inside your, just to show over here, uh, my DOM variable, if I do a simple document.call for a login, I can see this particular URL. And now I want to change it to, uh, instead of 100, I want to change it to 200. So now I can actually go ahead and pass on this information over here. But what is going to happen if I want to, if I inject this thing raw in a raw fashion, it's not going to work because it has a single code and a double code, which is going to get converted uh, and that into the eval call. When it goes into eval call, it's not going to get executed. So the JavaScript is going to give me error. So what we can do over here is we convert this whole payload into a string from char code. So it'll actually go into a simple character and we do a first eval. So we already have one eval in the browser and we add up the, uh, another eval from our side. So the first eval will actually convert this into this and the second eval inside the browser will actually execute. So it is a kind of a, a trick where we are doing a double eval. Uh, so this is a pretty, uh, when you are doing eval and if you eval the get parameters are going, uh, a call from a get is going into eval, then you need to do something like this. So we are doing a double eval over here and take it this as our payload. and pass it over here. And as you can see, the, the, the 200 red lined uh, flash file is actually loaded on our domain. So this is where we bypass the cross domain, we bypassed uh, the CSRF. It's a combination of a DOM-based XSS along with the CSRF and so on, because embed an object tag of a flash or a silver light uh, will allow you to do a, uh, do, to allow you to do a uh, SOP bypasses as such. 
So this is kind of a flash checking. It's possible to do a flash checking. It is possible to do a reverse flash checking as well. Uh, and this is a trick where we are doing a double eval. So we are doing the eval, the eval. It's like a double decode. It's like a, a double eval, which we are doing over here. Uh, same with the silver light. Uh, so flash application, after compilation, flash application create SWF file. Uh, over here, if you are using a silver light application, then uh, silver light is actually, uh, the application runs in a .NET framework. Uh, so you can write your code in a C-sharp or a VB.NET and compile the code and it will create a DLL uh, or a package which is get loaded in your browser as such. So it has a similarly like a Flax, it has its own markup language which you can uh, mark up uh, the XML data and then uh, you can compile the application and ap the application will actually create a something called XAP file. Uh, XAP file is nothing but the the compressed file, so it's a, like a zip file. Uh, and XAP file would have all the information needed to execute uh, your application. So it will have a config file, it will have a DLLs, uh, it will contain your uh, cross-domain policies, client access policies, and so on. So everything would be part of your XAP file. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to analyze XAP files as such over here. So we created a utility called XAP scan, uh, which allows you to do uh, scanning on your XAP files uh, or a zap file. Uh, so over here, you have this particular page. And if you browse down the page, there is a test.xap file over here, which runs the Silverlight, uh, which runs in, uh, in this particular plugin runs in the Silverlight. Uh, so we take this particular URL. And we start XAP scan here. Uh, so this is a typical GUI of XAP scan. Pass on the URL over here and start scan. So it'll go and grab uh, all the, it'll go grab XAP file, decompress the file, and find uh, important files as such. So it is getting the package. It is extracting the package as such. and trying to find uh, isolated storage, uh, like a local storage if the application is using. So this is your HTML package, this is your XAP package or a, a calls. Over here you can see the config file will show you the backend calls or a backend resource. So this particular Silverlight application is actually making a backend call to uh, backend uh, service-oriented architecture files called DVDs for less.asmx file. So we'll find that. Uh, isolated storage is essentially a local storage if your application or Silverlight application is doing a storage on your, on your box. Uh, so persistent cookies kind of stuff. And then you have assembly over here which is extracted from ILDSM. Uh, so you can identify whatever calls or something which you are interested in finding you can find over here uh, or a trace of variable and so on. And these are your policy, cross domain policy and a client access policy. So. Uh, you can see whether this particular application allows you to make a cross-domain calls or client access policy and so on. So this is how you can leverage uh, the tool to identify XAP-related, uh, Silverlight-related issues or application. Once you find the backend call, say for example over here we found that DVDs for less.asmx file, so there is, a, there is a SOAP file at the backend. So this is your uh, WSDL file. You can take this WSDL file and pretty much use another tool called WS Scanner. You can find that particular tool on our site as well. Uh, so this, uh, this particular tool will actually go ahead and uh, grab your WSDL file. It will convert. Uh, it will find the functions. And then it allows you to make an actual call. So you say, OK, this is my get product ID call, which I want to make. So you have ID equal to 1 here. And you actually get the information back. Uh, so Silverlight is a front end, and it is at the back end, it is making the call over a SOAP. And then you can actually start fuzzing this particular variable, uh, like a regular uh, post or a get variable. So we can start, say, for example, instead of a one, what if I put a dollar sign, and what if I put single quote, and so on. And it has a built-in uh, fuzzer as such, so you can use that if needed. So it'll say, OK, this is SQL client, uh, some error pointing to a, a possible potential SQL injection over here. 
so this is an interesting analysis which you can do. Uh, we just created another tool called App Code Trace. So this App Code Trace is essentially a tool which allows you to do uh, a runtime analysis on your binary, both uh, native DLLs or a Silverlight driven DLLs as such. Uh, so over here, what we are doing is there is a Silverlight application over here. Uh, so we do a view source here where we found this test.xap file over here. So our objective, our objective over here is to take the DLL file, patch DLL file, uh, and then load the DLL, uh, then load the XAP file. So whatever our XAP application is doing, we can monitor all these different calls which are going through the DLL. So that's what our objective is. So that's what we are planning over here. So we get taste XAP locally on, your, on our system. We change the extension to zip and uncompress the file. We start a command prompt here and go to the program files app code trace. Uh, so over here now what we are saying is okay, uh, my input is my test.dll file and it's a silver light. Uh, so it will start patching uh, the DLL, it will patch the DLL and now we have a new DLL with us. So now we take all the files back, uh, create an archive again, uh, change it to say XAP and put it back locally and we create a small HTML page which calls this test.xap file. Uh, so now we have the, the file loaded locally. We start a debug view over here, run as administrator. And now whatever call we make, we can actually watch uh, the DLL, what kind of calls which DLL file is making as such. So this is the calls which, are at, which DLL file is, is making. So from which we can identify whether it is using isolated storage or whether this particular call is using SOAP, whether this particular call is uh, using any 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 APIs which it's not supposed to use. So this is how uh, you can do a runtime analysis for Silverlight or a .NET uh, using the patching. Uh, so we go ahead and patch uh, actual binary and then try to uh, call the binary, and the binary uh, will actually show us all the all different calls. You can use this particular app code trace for your server side application as well. So, say for example, you have a DLLs and a server side application is using DLL, you patch the DLLs and then uh, call the DLLs and the DLL dump will be created uh, at runtime. So this again will help you in reducing the scope uh, scope and identifying the, the calls. Uh, and similarly, like we have looked at a flash jacking, there is possibility of a XAP jacking or a Silverlight jacking where again a combination of a DOM based XSS, CSRF and a Silverlight as we change uh, document.get element uh, to SWF file, we can change similarly to login.xap file as, as well. So what we are doing is just underlying component of a flash or SWF or XAP which we are changing dynamically. So both of these technologies actually uh, get into the browser by either object tag or embed tag. And both of these tags are essentially allows you to make a cross domain uh, calls like an image tag where you can actually, you are on a google.com but you can fetch image from a cnn.com. Similarly, uh, these two uh, object and an and a embed tag uh, will allow you to do so. So that gives you a rise to uh, a variant of click jacking. Now we are looking at the click jacking extended to uh, RIA space, be it a silver light or a flash. A uh, similar application we are looking at is analyzing mobile applications. Say for example, mobile application written in Android or iPhone uh, is again, inside your application, uh, you will look at the application and you will see, okay, this is a simple application, but inside the application, a, a small instance of a browser is created and then browser is actually making uh, a part of the calls. So we want to identify whether this particular application is using any browser driven components or a calls or not. Uh, so, you know, say for example, if you're using Android application, Android application it is, is creating into APK uh, file and APK is actually where you have a DEX uh, 
your Dex components would be residing and you can actually convert them back into a Java code and then you can run your uh, static analysis on top of it. Uh, so what you have over here is a, is a, is a scandroid.ruby component which we have, we have on our site which you can use uh, to scan. So for example, over here, it's a very simple buy me application uh, which runs on Android. Uh, so it looks very simple application which has been created, you buy and then you can see stuff over here. Now, if you want to analyze this particular application, uh, then uh, say for example, we run a scandroid and we say, okay, apk file, this is my buy.apk file, and I pass on the rule, which is residing on a rules.cfg file, for example, over here. And I run this particular. So this tool is essentially going to convert everything to the backward. So it'll convert apk to back to dex, and dex back to your Java, and then we'll run some rules on top of it. So it'll process everything, and. At the end, it will create two files, which is output.txt and a permissions.txt files. Uh, so you open output.txt file over here, and you can see uh, web view. So web views are essentially the browser-driven components which are running inside your uh, Android application. You can see over here, for example, uh, backend URLs as such, credit.php, uh, these are a web view, get setting, and so on. Uh, it loads URL uh, and so on. Uh, sorry. Uh, so this is a one analysis which we do a reverse tracking and try to identify uh, what kind of application created inside your APK file. And, uh, and you can see the permissions.txt file as such, which allows that, okay, this particular application allows you to make a internet calls or a network socket calls uh, on top of it. Uh, so this is how uh, quickly you can do a, a mobile application review, return in iPhone or Android and so on. Uh, and again, what we are looking at is what kind of uh, client-side components uh, this guy is using. Uh, so these, all these different techniques which we have seen, we can apply to uh, various different uh, browser components. For example, if we start uh, with HTML5, uh, there are various different a set of different new tags which are added in HTML5. Say, for example, a media tag which allows you to load a video and audio, uh, where on error or on poster, you can actually implement JavaScript alert. Uh, form tag has some new components added. Say, for example, on input new attribute, which takes a JavaScript. Uh, so there are very, very, various different interesting tags which are added in your, uh, in HTML5. So we just created a small utility called HTML5 scanner. Uh, so over here, you can pass on the URLs by one URL or the file. And uh, these are the, essentially a bunch of tags over here. You can see over here art and section and video and so on. So you just want to see whether this particular application is using HTML5 and if it is using HTML5 to what extent. And last two is very important. One is the local storage and the local data. So WebSQL and a local storage. So we say, okay, take a few URLs and scan for us. So to HTML5 and start over here. So you can see uh, this particular application is using this many tags, so we do a uh, fingerprinting or HTML5 fingerprinting and try to identify whether uh, some important tags are, are there or not. And if it finds, say, for example, section tag or so on, which is clearly HTML5 stuff, we'll come out and point it to. Uh, and over here, for example, you have a local data, so it'll show us uh, local data usage over here. So these are the local storage lines. Uh, local data or a local database has been used. Uh, so this is how you can play around with your HTML5 applications or HTML5 related stuff. So when we are focusing on HTML5, one is one of the area which is uh, part of HTML5 is uh, your storage. So it has a new uh, feature of interface for a storage which allows you to do a, a local storage on your browser. So for example, there is a get item and a set item to, the, uh, to your storage. So you can say local storage dot set item 
uh, this hash. It is more or less like your cookie, uh, which gets stored inside your browser, which is at the transport layer. This is at the DOM level as such. Uh, so you have that, that, that particular piece of information residing over here. One of the interesting thing in a local storage is that, that say for example, you have this local storage created on a login page. So when you logged in, uh, information gets stored in your local storage. Now this information is available across the domain. So say for example, you have a cross-site scripting at z.php and your local storage was created on a.php. If I access is on z.php, I can scrub the entire, lo entire your local storage as such. So say for example, oops. Uh, this is an application where a local storage or HTML5 component or local storage is used, for example. Uh, so we go to the login page over here. And this is again a Chrome plugin for developers, which will show us where the local storage has been used or so on. So we pass on this information and as soon as we log in, as you can see, the application has created a local storage here with some kind of a hash value uh, over here. And now this local storage is pretty much available across the domain. Uh, so local storage cat item hash. So this is how you can actually retrieve uh, any, any local value or local storage which is used. You can actually enumerate the local storage as well if you want. Uh, if you don't know this name hash, you can do a one, two, three, and whatever variables you want to harvest, you can actually harvest from a JavaScript. Now it has a persistent cross-site scripting, for example, over here. So we put it there. And now whoever visits that particular page, we are scrubbing their identities or uh, local storage hashes over here. So say, for example, if I go to the blog, uh, this is my XSS since I've got XSS. Now another user logs in and he visits the particular page and his hash will get harvested. Uh, so it, when you have a cross-site scripting and you're using local storage, it become a cocktail uh, and possible to exploit. Uh, so we contributed something on a beef as such and beef is also added nowadays. Uh, uh, beef is a framework for browser exploitation. Uh, so you can start a beef over here. It has a plugin for uh, over here. Okay, so beef has started here. It has a plugin to extract local storage and a session storage, and this is your zombie or your console running on the beef. Uh, and this is a beef console where you can see uh, HTML5 related stuff, local storage and a session storage. And as soon as someone get cross-site scripted, we can actually run a command over here. We say, okay, uh, grab all the local storage from the browser. So it'll actually run the command and is waiting for command to get executed over here. And we harvested a local storage over here. So for example, value hello world has been stored and so on. Similarly, you can extract a session storage as well. Again, you can use the trick of either, either a runtime analysis or, a, or a, a static code analysis to figure out whether, the, whether this particular application is using local storage or not. Uh, another vector is SQL injection. Uh, so WebSQL is a part of HTML5. It provides SQL database and allows one-time data loading uh, as such. Uh, so you have open database and execute SQL. And, uh, when this database created in the browser, it allows you to do offline browsing as well. So uh, pretty much it will create uh, the whole SQL, server-side SQL will get replicated on the client side, and then you can execute uh, pretty much select and whatever queries you want to execute. So over here, for example, we load the page and you can see there is a database over here, and then pretty much you can run a select query over here. So you can have this particular uh, data get loaded. And this is your actual calls here. You're running a query. Now you can do a client-side SQL injection. Say, for example, you have this variable one, which is going through the DOM. So instead of a one, if you do or one equal to one, for example, you get the whole data back on the browser. So if you have XSS and your banking is using 
for example, WebSQL, then pretty much you can go ahead and grab all the data from the, from the browser. Uh, DOM is essentially, as I said, uh, is now DOM 3, which allows you to do XPath and a lot of different stuff, which is already added on the our document object model. Uh, and one of the one of the injection is a DOM-based injections, DOM-based XSS uh, injection script in the DOM. Uh, several different ways: polluting eval stream, document dot XSS, so your document dot uh, write calls, your document dot inner HTML calls, and so on. So all these different calls will allow you to do a, a DOM-based XSS, JSON-based XSS is possible. And one of the interesting thing is a third-party abuse because you have this third-party stream which is actually coming into the browser, which allows you to perform uh, DOM-based access as, as such. So one of the interesting area for DOM-based application is a mashup application. So for example, this is a mashup application of two or three different applications running on this one domain. Uh, so you want to see someone's profile here. So you go ahead and say show profile of this guy. Now this particular stream is actually coming from third party and in some kind of XML format, and then it get parsed, chopped, and get loaded in your browser uh, through document.write or eval call. Now, the John has posted uh, something different. Uh, in his first name or last name, he's posted a JavaScript. So that script will actually come to your domain. Your domain will supply a, a raw script back to you, and then you actually execute in your browser. So again, these DOM-based accesses are very easy to find. Uh, when you do a static code analysis or when you do a runtime analysis of your JavaScript. Uh, another interesting area is a DOM-based injection and stealing. Uh, DOM is usually one-time loading. A uh, lot of information residing on the DOM. So one of the interesting thing is when you are doing a DOM-based application, DOM-based application at the slash page, the entire DOM will get loaded. And whatever variables which are global, are available across the application. So these global variables, and you are not going to change your DOM. When you go from one page to another, your DOM will remain same. Just the part of a DOM is going to get changed. So some, sometimes it's uh, due to a poor programming practice or the way application is written, it opens up a ba batch of global variables. You just uh, look at Google or look at any 2.0 application and look at how many global variables which are created uh, in your browser. All these global variables are nothing but the local storage. So pretty much if you have access as, then I can harvest or someone can actually harvest all the global variables from, uh, from your browser. So say for example over here, uh, we have a page over here. So this is how actually the, over here we are doing a cross-site scripting. Uh, via direct JSON parameter. And if a global variable is on it, we can say, okay, get that particular variable back, and you can actually go ahead and see uh, the value of the global variable. So it's pro possible to do a DOM injection and stealing of information using uh, DOM-based cross-site scripting. Another area which is abusing network calls, so HTML5 provides WebSocket and a uh, XHR level two call, it allows you to make a cross domain calls uh, via raw socket. Uh, a lot of malware and worms can, can actually go ahead and leverage this particular technology. Uh, so with a web socket, pretty much you can do a internal port scanning if you want. So you can actually go ahead and do the whole internal, internal uh, port scanning uh, using web sockets. Uh, XHR level two calls are, are now implemented in all the browsers. So in, it's essentially what, uh, what this particular call is doing is uh, when it makes a cross-browser call, it will pass on another HTTP header, which is called the origin header. Uh, and the origin header, along with some of the access calls, uh, will process your, your call or will reject your call. Uh, but one of the potential abuse over here is it allows you to do a one-way channel because anyway that particular call is going to go on a wire to a cross domain and then the domain will decide whether I want to send the content back to the server browser or not. And some of the browser will actually take the content will, but will not load into the DOM. So that's how the whole mechanism of this uh, XHR level two has been implemented. Uh, again, it's, it's a great because XHR level two is not going to replay your cookie. So it will not replay your cookie when you make the XHR level two call. So whole 
a new policy has been created. Uh, you can find it on the on the WTE.org, which is called uh, cr uh, Cross C R O S Cross Cross Origin Request Sharing Policy. So this policy actually uh, dictates which call to be entertained and which call not to be entertained. And uh, the new generation of tags or HTTP headers are added, which is origin or access and so on. And then you have always a traditional way of uh, abusing uh, your XHRs, uh, uh, your calls. So essentially what you are doing over here is uh, you have your trading application and when your trading application uh, you go to the trading application, you get authenticated, and then you end up on the attacker site, for example. And attacker site will actually uh, pass on you a CSRF page, uh, which force you to do a, a cross-domain call over here. So over here, for example, we are passing uh, CSRF uh, in the post, and we are adding uh, a hidden tag over here, and we are saying, OK, uh, pass on this JSON. So what we are doing is we are doing a CSRF with post and a, and a JSON over here. So actually on the wire, you will have something like this created. You have a nice little JSON going uh, with equal to uh, foo at the end. But most of these libraries are actually looking for the good JSON. So it will look for the start of the good JSON, and as soon as the JSON ends, it will start processing. It will not look at this, this final stuff over here. Or uh, this is over here we have a content type, which is a text plane. It's not JSON. But even though all these different libraries are actually jolly well execute uh, this particular uh, HTTP request. Uh, so you get the HTTP response back, and then you can process. Similar, similarly, it's possible to do a CSRF with AMF traffic as, as well. So you, all the traffic, as you can see over here, is AMF. And when you this particular thing will go on wire, it will make the nice AMF envelope and will actually go ahead and hit uh, to the server. And then uh, some of the click jacking possibility uh, with HTML5 uh, layering. So HTML has canvas and layer and so on, which allows you to uh, do a click jacking. Where in a click jacking, as a user, you will assume you are firing this particular event, but at the back end, some other, completely some other event will get executed as such. So for example, very quickly uh, over here, you have a uh, little, say, claim iPod over here, and you have this uh, page over here. Now just for the sake of clarity, I'm just putting this. This button is not required as such. Uh, so over here, uh, when you click this particular button, so you have this layered created. So at the back end, there is an iframe. And in the iframe, you have loaded a completely different page, which is called a Google page. And Google's I am feeling lucky button has been mapped to your uh, iPod button. So when you click the iPod button, actually you are clicking, clicking the I am feeling lucky button. This is again a kind of a, a click jacking, which we are doing like we have seen a flash jacking and a server light jacking. It's a click jacking where we are leveraging some of these HTML5 features. Uh, and the frames and so on. So there is a, there is a countermeasures for it of the uh, frame busting code which you can put, which, say, which, don't allow, which will not allow you to uh, load a, your page into any, any other's frame as such. So these are all about attacks, and uh, you can do a reverse engineering to identify HTML5 based components. You can do reverse engineering to find flash based components and uh, silver light and so on. And pretty much, uh, we are putting some new tools out there, XAP scan for uh, Silverlight analysis. You have uh, app code trace for Silverlight analysis, HTML5 scanner uh, for HTML5 analysis, DOM scan and DOM tracer is already out there, and so on. Uh, from the defending side, uh, security at code level, so at JS, Flash, XAP should not have a server side logic. So don't put your business logic there. Don't put your data access logic there. It's, Understand them as a very simple presentation layer only. Uh, obfuscation may help a little bit, not much. Uh, source code and object code analysis during black box testing is required if your application is using Flash and a JSON and a, uh, and a Silverlight extensively. Uh, resource discovery and fuzzing uh, must for SOAP, JSON, and AMF to uh, identify backend issues. Uh, careful with HTML5 implementation, uh, particularly WebSQL and a storage. Uh, DOM-based analysis and scanning is required, how your developers are putting your DOM-based calls. 
uh, whether they are using DEVAL or they are using JSON parse and so on. Don't don't eval it. Like use a parsing over evaling. Uh, so you can do that uh, cross stream analysis with a third party. Uh, so what is coming from a third party is very important. Uh, so one definitely you can put a defense at the, your uh, your code level, and another is a short term measures. If you are taking taking, then you can put a uh, defense at a filtering level where you you can put a firewall. But one of the interesting thing with the 2.0 application is that that you need a incoming defense as well. So say for example, you are taking information, your application is taking information from a CNN and then tunneling that information to your client. So at that proxy level, you have to do an outgoing uh, filtering where you don't allow a script tag to go from a CNN to your end client and so on. And then definitely a server side stream uh, which needs support for AMF, which needs support for JSON and so on. That is always uh, required on the server side. Yeah, that's pretty much uh, pretty much it. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much for listening. To it.